Hi, and welcome to another edition of The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sport's top athletes and the people who shape the game. Brought to you by Local 59 and their line of steel furniture. See it at local59.com. I'm your host, Dean Gemmel, and this edition is the second half of a two-part interview with Jill Officer of Team Jennifer Jones. Talking about Jennifer and great shots, let's talk about the shot in the uh, in the final. Uh, Pretty good, eh? Yeah, that wasn't bad. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's uh, one of the few times I, I've heard curling on NPR down here in the United States. What were you thinking as you're waiting to sweep the shot? I mean, how did you feel when, when she was throwing it? Yeah, well, obviously that was kind of all we had for a shot. So um, Kathy and Jen were discussing it, and Kathy Goche and I were um, cleaning the ice as we normally do. And, you know, it was kind of funny because Kathy Goche actually, like when she finished cleaning the ice, she came down to me and she said, she says, you know, Jilly, uh, we missed this shot twice in Edmonton playing in Edmonton once over the top and once behind and I just tried to block that out because I didn't want her to jinx <laughs> the jinx the shot so um but you know in hindsight it's pretty interesting that she said that you know third time's a charm we made the shot on that one so you know Jen came down and I tried to just act really normal like and do my my typical thing with her and you know okay what what are we doing and what kind of weight are you throwing and just tried to make it normal for her to make it comfortable because obviously you know it was a big big shots and so she got in the hack and you know she she just came flying out of the hack like I couldn't believe how fast she came out and they called us on pretty pretty much right away so Kathy and I put our heads down and we just started sweeping I think my eyes were were half closed and I was a little bit worried about banging brooms with her because I was sweeping so hard and I was also worried because I was along the boards on the side and so I was trying to make sure that I wasn't going to trip or anything and when they called us off I they called us off so um so firmly, I was I was a little bit worried that we'd overswept it. But when I looked up and then it hit, and it, just watching it go into that rock in the house was just unbelievable. Like that's the one moment that I can continuously recall in my mind, and just knowing that she had so much weight on that rock that it, like Kathy Overton didn't even really need to sweep it um, behind the T line. And so when I saw it going for that rock and it and it hit, I just started jumping I honestly felt like I couldn't jump high enough or scream loud enough and I was all over the place speaking of screaming (laughs) I I was I I was a bit of a horseshoe and then I was just I made a beeline to Jen down at the other end of the ice it was just an amazing moment speaking of screaming I was wondering if anyone had measured the decibel level of of your team after that shot (laughs) yeah I haven't heard any decibel level but uh you know I I couldn't hear anything else but myself so (laughs) Here's another take on it. What did you say to Jen Hanna's team as you shook hands? Uh, you know what? By that point, it was just kind of like, you know, you're in that, that kind of headspace where it's like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do type thing. And we just shook their hand. And we said, you know, great game. Because, I mean, Jen Hanna was just, I mean, for the last half of the week and in that game, she just played unbelievable. She was terrific. Like, she made some really terrific shots. And, you know, we got to know their team a little bit throughout the week because we often played on the same draw as them and we would share the locker room with them and maybe one other team. And so we got to know them pretty well. So it was a real honor to be able to play them in the in the final. And, uh, you know, if things had gone the other way, I would have been really, you know, happy for them and really proud because they would have deserved it. But we just said, you know, great game and we gave them a hug and, you know, like they, you know, they, they were really good. They're very, um, they're very humble. Yeah, I, you know, I did think they had a great reaction to that kind of shot because it's pretty crushing, and uh, I thought they reacted pretty professionally. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I really, really admire their team, and, uh, you know, I've told, uh, I've told Jen Hanna that. I, I think that they're a terrific team, and I think that they'll be back, and, you know, they've got a lot of talent, and they, it, I just, you know, I really like their perspective on, on the game and, you know, that what, are you, what are you going to do? type thing you know Jennifer made the shot and we made the shot and we won and you know like Jen just kind of react Jen Hannah reacts like you know what am I going to do she made the shot it was a great shot way to go good luck right and I just think that that's uh, a really honorable thing to do so um let's talk about the trip to the world you know in it it in some ways, it seems the uh, troubles for your team started almost as soon as you left St. John's a little bit. You know, Kathy had the inner ear infection, had to get off the plane in Toronto. Then there was concern about whether she'd be able to even go. How, um, how complicated were and distracting were the weeks before the Worlds? Um, you know, it, it, you're right. It was distracting. And, and, I mean, we were worried about Kathy, but we didn't really know what we could, uh, what we could do. She, she was looking after herself. She was going to see her doctors and that kind of thing. And, you know, so we were just hoping that it wasn't going to be too much problem. We figured the doctors would be able to, um, 
to do something for her. But I think what, for me, myself anyways, what was more distracting was just the attention that our team received um, between winning the Scott and, and going to the Worlds because the, the finish to our game was so dramatic um, that, I mean, that shot was played over and over again for, you know, probably at least, uh, at least a week, you know, I would bet that it was on TV every day. And, you know, so we had a lot of attention because of that. And it was really, that was what was more challenging for me was to be able to go out and about, you know, I live here in Brandon, so it's a bit of a smaller community and, you know, it, it's kind of a curling crazy community. So for me going out to the grocery store or going out, somewhere else or going to the mall it was really hard to walk anywhere without someone coming up and saying oh congratulations you know you guys did great and good luck and you know which is really awesome but it I think it you know to some degree it's like it's a bit of a distraction you know knowing that um, there's just so much attention on the win and everything and you know you go to the curling club to try to practice and people keep coming up to you and you know, which is really awesome because it's, uh, you know, the community here anyways has been very, very supportive. But I think that was what was more challenging was to be able to get that recovery time and then, you know, make sure that we were staying staying sharp and practicing and whatever and, and also being prepared for an overseas trip. So, right. yeah, it, it was a bit challenging. Then, of course, you get to the event over in Scotland and... Uh you know, as much as people are critical of the CCA right now, I honestly think the World Curling Federation might be worse. But, you know, you get to the Worlds and it's in a rec center in a building with a pool in it. And I got to think that was a little disappointing. I mean, how, how did you, I mean, you guys put a brave face on it, I thought. But you show up and you've got pretty bad conditions. And how disappointing was that? Yeah, you know, it was disappointing because, you know. We're, I mean, the we're, place was called the Lagoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it really was disappointing. I mean, you know, we're, we're really spoiled here in Canada. We have, we have terrific resources for our game, and, uh, you know, we should feel very fortunate for that, and we have terrific ice makers. And, you know, the ice makers over there were, were from Canada as well. And, um, but, I mean, when you're dealing with, you know, a situation like that, I know that they worked really hard to, to try to get the ice as consistent as they could. But, you know, with the humidity in the building and the humidity from the pool, and from what I understand, there was some resistance a little bit at times from the uh, sort of the town council that owned the Lagoon Center. So there was some challenges in trying to get the resources that the ice makers needed to be able to to make the ice the best that they could. So it was pretty disappointing and, you know, to play on pretty inconsistent ice. But, you know, we just didn't adjust that well either. You know, I mean, obviously there were other teams that adjusted a lot better than we did, and we just uh, for some reason found it a little bit challenging, you know, to uh, to really figure it out and, and to understand how it changed. And, you know, there was a couple of games where we got up really early, and at fifth end we were totally in control, and we ended up losing the game because the ice changed in the second half. And, I mean, our playoff game was a prime example of that. That's exactly what happened. I think we were up 5-2 or 5-1 at fifth end, and, you know, the ice changed so much in the second half, and we just didn't believe it and didn't figure it out, and, and you know, it cost us the game. So it was pretty disappointing. And, you know, the whole atmosphere in general was pretty disappointing. I mean, they had a tent set up outside to act as a bit of a lounge bar area, and it was pretty much, you know, empty every night. And, I mean, my dad and his buddy served themselves for a couple hours in there because there was nobody in there. <laughs> it, you know, it just astounds me because, I mean, I can understand the, de the desire to have a world championship in an event in an area where maybe curling isn't very popular and you're hoping to grow the game, but... You know, I certainly couldn't imagine them playing the Super Bowl in Uruguay or something, you know, just, you know, to promote the sport down there. It doesn't make any sense to me to have it in places where it's, the sport isn't going to look really good. So I, I don't understand the World Curling Federation at all in that. And then, you know, I, I think you're right. I don't think you guys had the best week, but, I, you know, I, it certainly would have been better to see a, a great women's event, especially the first year when they've split the men's and women's like that. And, uh, you know, I can't believe that, you know, you know they're having an event and, and having a conflict with the city council is just bizarre to me. But Yeah, well, you know, I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, especially the birthplace of, uh, of curling and, you know, like we were in, in Paisley and they have a church there called the Paisley Abbey. And that's apparently the first known site of the game of curling. So we were right in the heart of the home and the birthplace of curling. And it just... You know, you could walk into a restaurant or, or a store or a shop or something like a block away from the center and people, you know, we got our Canada jackets on and people don't even realize that there's an international competition happening like 
a block away from from where they are and so that was pretty disappointing too you know like just knowing that people didn't care and you know didn't think that it was a big deal and you know like a world championship in anything is a big deal and so it, it was pretty disappointing that there wasn't many fans and you know it, it's a far cry from uh, St. John's Newfoundland where you know packed to the rafters and even our provincial championships in in Surus here in Manitoba like you know it was a way better event than than it was in Scotland so it was pretty disappointing because it just didn't feel like a world championship so yeah let's hope in Torino they get things together a little bit better but um <laughs> you know I don't want to focus too much on ineptitude but I want to get your final comments on uh, the CBC CCA conflict going on right now I haven't asked any curlers about it, but uh, at first I thought, well, maybe the CCA is just brilliant here and brilliant negotiators, but I'm starting to get concerned that's not the case, and I'm starting to get a little worried that maybe they're going to ask the curling show to, to broadcast the events now. What do you think about it? Good for you. Wasn't yeah, it'd be great for me. I don't think it'd be too good for the curling fans, though, and the coverage. But what do you think about it, and how do you think it's going to play out? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I... Uh I don't know possibly enough details to to make a a real good comment about it, but you know I think that um, obviously there was a lot of um, a lot of feedback about the the way the curling was broadcast last year, and I'm not really sure what happened in the postseason negotiations with the between the CCA and CBC that it that it came to the point that it has. But you know I'm really hopeful that the CCA can negotiate a deal and. Uh, I mean, with a broadcaster that can, you know, provide what it is that the fans want and, and what, what the CCA wants and what the curlers want. Because, you know, I think that the, the amount of broadcasting that curling has received over the last number of years is a huge asset to our game. And if we don't have a broadcaster broadcasting that, then that's going to be a real uh, dent in the popularity of our game. So, you know, I'm really hopeful that they can come to an agreement with uh, with somebody, and maybe even if it's the CBC again, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. But, you know, as long as we, we have a broadcaster covering our game, then, uh, you know, I think that uh, we'll be okay. So I hope the CCA can... Uh, can negotiate a deal for that. Yeah, you know, it is a good property, curling. I mean, if you look at the ratings for curling on TV, it gets great ratings, so it shouldn't be that uh, difficult to, to have a good deal that works for fans and, and in terms of financial reimbursement. But hopefully it works out in the next little bit. Absolutely. Well, look, I want to thank you for your time, Jill. Uh, I appreciate it, and I hope you guys have a great run at the trials and uh, a great run next season. Look forward to watching you. Thanks very much, Dean. I appreciate you uh, having me on the show. And hopefully we'll have a chance to talk during the season. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Jill. Okay, take care. That's our interview with Jill Officer on The Curling Show, brought to you by Local 59 and their line of steel furniture, available at local59.com. Thanks for listening. Here's another bit of curious metal from Black Pudding. <laughs>